Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrea Whistler. I'm a visiting assistant professor in the college and director of the university's program on justice and peace. And it's been my great honor to be the CSJ's representative uh, here to work with uh, these four outstanding uh, undergraduate students you are going to hear from tonight about their research fellowships throughout the world. Um, and I had the pleasure of introducing them. Um, so I'm going to give quick introductions um, to the four fellows. And um, then we are going to hear from them. They're going to give about eight minute presentations. Then we're going to have question and answer uh, time, which can be questions directed specifically to the fellows about their research, but also questions about um, the summer 2013 um, call for applications as well. Okay, because we definitely recognize you are here to hear these wonderful presentations, but also we hope you are very interested in applying for a fellowship yourself. Okay, uh, I'm going to start and introduce you to Shay Houlihan. Shay is a senior in the School of Foreign Service, majoring in international politics. Uh, we want to congratulate. Congratulate Shay because he just was named a Marshall Scholar. Um, yeah. uh, he will be investigating emerging topics in refugee and forced migration studies. Uh, last year, Shay studied at St. Peter's College, University of Oxford, where he also rode. Uh, Shay has worked at the Georgetown Institute for the Study of International Migration, as well as Oxford refugee, Oxford's Refugee Studies Center. As part of this work, uh, Shay was uh, studying, testing new concepts of survival and crisis management, um, crisis migration in Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia, Zambia in 2012. He plans to continue to conceive of and act on new ways of extending international protection to forced migrants based in part on this vital interest of states. Today, Shay will be presenting on his research in Uganda. Lisa Frank, is Lisa Lisa's second? Lisa Frank is a senior in the college, majoring in Spanish and government. She's from Portland, Oregon, and hopes to return there after graduation to work in local politics, youth engagement, and education. She lives in the Justice and Diversity Living and Learning, uh, Justice and Diversity in Action Living and Learning community, uh, which Professor McMurrow is the faculty in residence for. Thanks for coming. Um, and she spent a semester in Quito, Ecuador. Here at Georgetown, she is involved in GEO Pride, GASA, Hoyas for Immigrant Rights, the Women Advocating Gender Equity Fellowship, and the Jewish Student. Association. She's currently writing a government honors thesis about policies that restrict or facilitate undocumented students' access to higher education and doing that in conjunction with her work for the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor. Today, Lisa will be presenting on her research in Bolivia. Charlotte Markson is a senior in the School of Foreign Service, also majoring in international national politics with a concentration in international law. She's originally from southern Germany, and Charlotte transferred here to Georgetown after her freshman year. On campus, Charlotte has worked with the CSJ and the DC Reads program, and is involved with germs. I always feel really funny saying that. She has first become involved with uh, political and social issues in Latin America after spending a gap year after high school in Peru. Uh, during this time, she worked in a special education school, two kindergartens with nutritional programs, and a health clinic. So tonight, Charlotte is presenting on her research in Uruguay. Last but not least, uh, Masha Goncharova is a junior in the Georgetown College with majors in English and art history and a minor in social and political thought. She was born in Moscow, Russia, and moved to California when she was in the second grade. At Georgetown, Masha's bid project is rebuilding the student television station, Georgetown University Television. I didn't even know we had that. Um, additionally, she helps edit the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs, sits on the board of the Georgetown University Art Aficionados, and contributes to the viewpoint column of the student newspaper, The Hoya. On weekends, Masha teaches piano, volunteers for DC Autism Buddies. Her hobbies include kayaking on the Potomac and exploring DC by bike. Tonight, Masha will be presenting on her research in Paris and Russia. It really has been my extreme pleasure to work with these four students. I have learned so much from them. They, had, they, they were courageous. Uh, they challenged themselves as well as each other. Uh, they asked really important 
important critical questions, and I know just based on this research uh, that the research world has a lot to look forward to in their future contributions. So thank you very much and congratulations. And shall I turn it over to Shay? Great. Hello everyone, my name is Shay Houlihan and I'm a senior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics. And I just want to say that Georgetown University is great for a number of reasons, but not least of which um, for this fellowship and this particular opportunity. I'd like to thank the Berkeley Center um, for its wonderful support and its quite generous um, financial support in particular for, for research. I'd also like to thank Oche Campion Jesuit College in Gulu, Uganda, which was my host institution, my home, um, for three weeks in, in June. I'm here to talk about social justice and, and education at Oche Campion in, in Gulu. I was there this summer, um, as I mentioned, and I was there in a particular fashion because it's been about five years since the cessation of conflict and civil strife in northern Uganda. Until 2007, and roughly since the mid-1980s, um, Joseph Kony of the notorious Kony 2012 debacle earlier this year. Um, Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army operated in northern Uganda and in fact used northern Uganda and Gulu as a base to carry out attacks in South Sudan, eastern DRC, and in the country of Uganda itself. My research question, um, especially studying at Oche, was how can education and social justice inform peace building in a recently post-conflict environment? And I say that because the Jesuits, being who they are, were vitally interested in going to where the need was greatest in Uganda. And so they built Oche Campion Jesuit College in Gulu, knowing that that was where the need was greatest. Just to give a little bit of background, um, as I mentioned, widespread civil strife and conflict um, was visited on northern Uganda, especially Gulu, between the 1980s and, and 2007. Some 1.8 million people were internally displaced, and some 30,000 children were actually abducted, many of whom were placed um, within Joseph Kony's armies. So we're talking about widespread um, human rights abuses. This has meaningful implications even five years after the conflict, as you can imagine because children who are now 18 to 20 years old were born in the midst of conflict and until 2007 had only known conflict for all of their lives. And so when we think about education and social justice, um, there are very meaningful implications for, for how the Jesuits, or for that matter, state schools go about that. Oche Campion Jesuit College um, was started, or at least the idea was germinated in 2005 when Jim Stoke, um, to your far left, and um, Father Tony Walk um, got together. Um, they had both been from the Wisconsin province of the Society of Jesus, and they were transferred to the East African province of the Society of Jesus. Both of them had been graduates of Campion Jesuit College in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Um, they, they were both alumni there. And after that original Campion Jesuit High School closed in Wisconsin, they contacted a lot of alumni and said, you know, hey, it'd be great if we would be if we could start another Jesuit high school. And we're in Uganda now, and the need is very great. So that generosity from the United States and that philanthropic support, which raised $1.2 million, I might add, that, that, that generosity was met um, on the Ugandan side as well. Brothers Roger Ochin and Francis Okwira actually donated 98.5 acres of land. Um, I didn't know how big that was <laughs> until I went there, but it's a substantial part of land, and, and I'll, I'll show you why. But So this is where the idea came from. Now, my research question, as I said, looked at education and social justice informing peace building in a recently post-conflict environment. And I've discovered over the course of that investigation that it informs peace building in two significant fora. One is formal, formal education, and the other is informal education. In formal education, um, talking about classes, uh, 
Oche actually sponsors a liberal arts education, as you might expect from a Jesuit institution, but it also sponsors vocational training, um, farming, which is the main industry in northern Uganda. Not only farming, but also textile. There, there's one classroom out of about eight classrooms in total. One classroom is entirely devoted to, to sewing machines. Um, so really, the Jesuits, at least in this case, are trying to combine liberal arts education with um, on-the-ground practical vocational training as well. Education matters in this way um, for resiliency. One of the studies I came across over the course of my research um, from Kate Bird, 2010, found that coping strategies um, by recent combatants matters for how these individuals are able to get new jobs or adjust to relocation. Education, formal education, matters for generating the types of skills that can be transferred to a different situation, and especially in a post-conflict environment. Formal ed education also matters in, in other unobvious ways. Um, Brother Godfrey Maserica, who is the, the Dean of Students, noted that it is difficult to manipulate an educated person. Um, he was talking in the context of local politicians, which he happened to find corrupt. He said education, being able to um, convince people who know how to read or write, it looks very different than trying to convince people who don't know how to read or write. John Mary Caragua, who was another teacher, noted that at Oche, they tried to create a, a culture of life because when 30,000 children have been abducted and when many of them have been used as child soldiers, oftentimes life is spent as a, as a very common currency. And so there is uh, less respect for life um, than you might find elsewhere. Again, we're talking about families that had been each family that I met had been directly affected by, by the violence, by one or more family members either being killed or being abducted or being used in some way by the Lord's Resistance Army or by the government for that matter. Another form which is significant is, is informal education. And in this way, I looked at social justice and how it is taught at Oche. Music, dance, and drama is a vibrant part of life in southern central Africa um, for many, many children, many youth. At Oche, music, dance, and drama, MDD, um, was practiced by Undugu family, which is a group that originally started in Kenya by another Jesuit, Stephen Maselle, um, who is trying to promote fraternity and, and familyhood, which is what Undugu means, and it's a Swahili word. word. At, at Oche, I found um, almost peace and reconciliation sessions that went on. And we're not talking about where everyone sat in a circle and, and shared their thoughts. We're talking about sports and games and regular childhood activities, but done expressly for the purpose of, of bringing children together. And not just children from northern Uganda, but children from all over the country, because Oche tries to attract children from southern Uganda, from Kampala, from Imbarara. And all of this matters again. So because of time constraints, I'll, I'll leave you with a few takeaways. I mentioned the, the fact that Oche tries to recruit students from every region in Uganda. And that's important because there are serious regional divides between the North and South. I met um, Nurse Susan Aka, who actually mentioned that she personally blames um, Yohiri Museveni, the president of Uganda, for cutting off Northern Uganda from Southern Uganda. Um, in the late 1990s, it's reported, and to some significant extent substantiated, that the government tried to cut off the, the main artery, the main road between Kampala and Gulu. And this wasn't to, um, in an effort to, to try to ameliorate their violence. It was an effort to, to separate the violence, to effectively contain the LRA and Joseph Kony in the North. And she still, Nurse Susan still, personally blames President Museveni for that. And that's just one example of, of many examples I found where, where there's a serious ethnic and tribal divide between the North and South. And Oche is trying to ameliorate that, like I said, um, by bringing students together, by, by teaching them in the, in the same classrooms, by having them sleep in the same dormitories. All of it mattered. Oche's target audience, um, well, the target constituency is 
bright but low income students, which I, I can't emphasize how, how significant that is, given that the Ugandan government has instituted universal primary education in the late 90s, but state schools are, are very poorly managed and there's something less than two pennies, is spent, two SUS pennies are spent on, on students. And the fact that the Jesuits intentionally subsidize education for every single one of their 240 students, and in fact subsidizing entire education for 30% of that students, for 30% of those students rather, all of that matters. And finally, um, I'd just like to leave you with, with this idea that, that education and, and social justice in this particular post-conflict environment is centered around empower, empowerment. And, and student empowerment. Not everyone that I met in northern Uganda, and especially not everyone in Gulu that I met, was, was a victim. And oftentimes when, when you're looking at, at child soldiers and when you're talking about these very, very serious issues, um, there's a tendency to focus on the victimhood of these people. And at least in this case, Oche and the Society of Jesus is very concerned about focusing on their empowerment instead. Thank you very much. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Charlotte. Um, we kind of switched up the order, so. Um, I'm Sam J, senior in the SFS, also an international politics major. Um, and this early summer, I had the good fortune to go to Uruguay. Um, I can just echo what Shay said. I'm very thankful to the Berkeley Center, to Rod Jacob, who started this project, who I was fortunate enough to meet afterwards. Um, to all the professors and people at the Berkeley Center who helped us throughout this project because we definitely could not have done it on our own. And um, to the Catholic University in Uruguay that was my host and um, really gave me great opportunities for research. So my research project, I went to Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay for three weeks. And my research was slightly unusual in the sense that I didn't have a structured research question when I went there. We basically had a contact in the Catholic University and they said, yes, we're working on social justice. We want someone to come visit. We want to show you things. Just come. So I basically got on a plane and walked into the uh, university right after landing and sat down with the head of the Department for Educational Policy and Management. And he gave me an itinerary for three weeks, and it was like four pages long. So he was like, here are all the things I want you to see. And that's basically how my research started. Um, and so I realized that this very small university that was officially opened in 1984, um, and it's the only Catholic, the only Jesuit university in this very small country. Uruguay is three million people, so it's tiny. So... Um, and this very small university actually is doing a lot of work in the field of social justice. Um, so effectively, my question was, what is this university doing? And is it useful for us? And can I can do it? Does it make sense to me um, coming from here? And so I, I saw three projects that I was introduced to that were all working on social justice in different ways. Um, and there was the Quality Improvement Program the Fe Alegria Network, and the Social Justice and Education Network. And so I'm just going to give you a short overview of those three programs that were developed in the Catholic University. Um, so the Quality Improvement Program was started in the university, I think, about six years ago. Um, the university is Catholic and private, obviously, and the professors and, and students at the university noticed that in, in Uruguay there's a huge problem between educational coverage and quality. So every every kid in Uruguay can go to school. Everyone c gets an education. The question is, what kind of education do you get? And there's a huge divide between pr private and public. And so the university said, well, we have the resources. We have an idea of what a good education might need. So let's go to schools and let's offer them a an improvement program. And so Mora Puesta, who is the, the director of this program, said, if a center decides to use this tool, it starts a process that involves the entire center. It's not simply applied from the outside. 
The system lets the school self-evaluate and lets them discover their strengths, weaknesses, and areas where they can improve. So basically, the university sends faculty and sends staff to elementary schools, high schools, even informal education centers that are like after school programs and helps those schools and centers look at themselves, evaluate what the center or the school thinks is quality in education, what they want to achieve and where they think they're lacking and where they need to improve and how they can get there. So that's the first program I visited. Um, the second one is the Fe Alegria Network. So Fe Alegria is actually a Jesuit school network that was founded in Venezuela in 1955 and is now in, I think, 17 countries in Latin America. Um, so they have schools all throughout Latin America. And the idea of this network is to provide education to the poorest sectors of society. So provide education for those children that live outside of the city that can't get a good education. Um, and in Uruguay, Fe Alegria didn't start until 2009. Now that has to do with a lot of internal politics in Uruguay. Uruguay is very, very fiercely secular, and Catholic private education is struggling immensely to kind of find its place and establish itself. And so it took until 2009 that the Catholic University said, well, we're going to sponsor this. We're going to help this network find its place in Uruguay. And so the network actually is now it's it, the network's headquarters in Uruguay are in the Catholic University. So the staff and the faculty in the university helped it establish itself. And different from other countries where Fe Alegria actually builds individual new schools, in Uruguay, they went to already existing schools and offered the schools to become members of the network and said, would you like to join us? We have this new approach to education. It's a little different, but we think we could work together. And so... These are two of the schools, Don Bosco and San Adolfo, where I visited, um, both elementary schools that have joined the network. And the major benefits for the schools are, first of all, Fe Alegria is a huge network, and they can help fundraise, they can help finance. And many of these private schools are struggling immensely to keep their buildings in good conditions to find, to pay for books, very basic things. And so the network is kind of helping them establish that. And at the same time, it's giving the education a very distinct nature. It's not just private, it's not just separate, it's Catholic, it's Jesuit, and it's really focused on those children who are disadvantaged. And another, um, effort the Fe Alegria Network makes is that, yes, it is private education. So, yes, you are, if you can, you're asked to contribute something to your education, but scholarships are available to anyone who needs them, and the focus is really on giving education to anyone who, who wants it. And the last project that the Catholic University started um, or became a part of last year um, is the Social Justice and Education Network. It was initially started in a partnership between the university in Madrid and a university in Chile. And basically, the network is um, a, a group of faculty in each, in each university that said, social justice is a topic we need to address now. It's something that's up and coming, and people need to learn about it, and we need to formally address it in our university. And so the Catholic University in Uruguay, because it already has so many projects in this area, Th um, said, yes, we can contribute to this, and we'd like this formal framework to work in. And so the Social Justice Network is really an, an intent to gather resources, encourage research, help faculty exchange and go to different universities and work together. And um, there's actually, I think, eight or nine universities in Latin America that are working together to, with Spain on this issue. So after this very brief... Uh, introduction to very many different things I saw in three weeks. Um, I think the big takeaways were that I saw, I was just incredibly impressed what such a small university has done in so little time, because we go to a Jesuit university with tons of programs, but we were also founded <laughs> a while ago, <laughs> and this university was only open in 1984, and they've already 
made a significant impact in in Montevideo in Uruguay as a whole and now through this network are really starting to make an impact internationally and so I came away with kind of a couple of ideas of what it really means to to get a Jesuit education and how a university can try and share that education with a city with a country and not just stay within its own borders um and I realized how similar many of the issues were this Uruguay was dealing with in terms of public education and private education and the differences and how we can come together. And um, yeah, in the end, my, my really my hope was that the projects that I saw would continue. They're all still very young. Um, they're currently working well. And so I hope that they're going to develop further and kind of uh, continue strong. And finally, I hope that we can start more of a cooperation between our universities here in the U.S. and universities in South America because I was, I quite honestly wasn't aware of the extent to which our challenges and our, our projects that we're working on are similar. And so I think there's a lot to share and um, there could be a lot of benefit from working together. Uh, my name is Lisa. I, uh, I'm a senior in the college. I study Spanish and government. And I had the opportunity to go to Bolivia this summer for three weeks. Um, I want to echo my peers in thanking the Berkeley Center, Professor Whistler, Professor Martin, um, Professor Carnes, Father Carnes, and everyone else who has helped us with this project. Um, I also want to mention Silvana Gonzalez was um, my, uh, my main helper and um, an advisor and friend when I was in Bolivia. Uh, she works for Faye Alegría. I'll be talking more about their programs tonight. So this is Bolivia. It's a country of, of 10 million people. Uh, some of the things that I was really interested in before I went down to the country was uh, the language makeup and ethnic makeup of the country. Um, so it is, you know, most people do speak Spanish, but in cities like La Paz, um, about a third of the people speak Aymara. That's one indigenous language. Another third speak Quechua. So I was really interested to see how both ethnic identities and uh, indigenous languages play into education. Um, and also, you know, what sort of value systems come into play when you're talking about Catholic programs in communities that are Catholic, but also have a long tradition of other of other religious beliefs and other uh, and other faiths. Um, it's a very poor country. Uh, so that's another that's another challenge that I knew I was going to be looking at coming down there. Um, Bolivia is is one of, if not the poorest countries in South America. Uh, so I was curious to see, you know, what Fe Alegria is able to do in that context for students living in very, very difficult conditions. Um, and also what they're able to do with the resources of the state, uh, which are which are minimal. Um, the president right now is Evo Morales. He's been uh, a controversial but interesting figure. He's put into place a, a few new education policies that I'll talk about um, that have had a huge impact on Faye Alegria's work in Bolivia, uh, some positive, some not so much. Um, and he is also important because he's the first indigenous president that Bolivia has had, even though the country is the first president that is that is self-identified um, in his political role as being an indigenous. And this is in a country that's more than 60% indigenous. And this exclusion from politics um, was also an exclusion from education until about the 1990s. Uh, so I was coming to, to Bolivia now in 2012 to see what has changed over the last few years um, in the very short period of time that the government has committed to fully opening up access to education to everyone. So my main research question um, in addition to to all of those all of those thoughts and questions I had before going down to Bolivia, was what role do values play in education? Um, I was curious about what the values are that are upheld by Faye Alegria. Um, and again, just to clarify, Faye Alegria, um, in addition to the work that they're doing in Uruguay, they're they're all throughout Latin America, um, like Charlotte had, Charlotte had mentioned, and they've been in Bolivia for almost 50 years. Uh, so it's a very different story from what you have in Uruguay. And the way Faye Alegria programs work in Bolivia is they're almost like charter schools. They're they're privately run um, by Faye Alegria staff and volunteers, uh, but they're public programs. They're the normal teaching positions are financed by the government and they're accessible to everyone. So in a lot of neighborhoods, your neighborhood school might be run by Faye Alegria, but they also have a lot of extra programs, things like special education, job training programs, radio education that occur either in addition to or outside of a regular school. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about all of those today. Uh, the Faye Alegria has described it as como un monstro. It's like a monster. It's 
Um, that, that's the way it was described to me by, by Father Rene Cardozo, who's, who's in charge of the, all the Jesuits in Bolivia, the Jesuit province. Um, but they're doing a lot of great work, and I encourage you to, to check out um, some of the other programs they're doing. Um, and then finally, I was looking at how their values are connected to social justice. Um, and what I was looking at with these values is the values that are human values, Christian values, Jesuit values. Um, and I want to mention just a couple of those tonight. Um, one is the Magis, a concept that we're, and the Magis for service, a concept we're familiar with here at Georgetown, doing more, doing more for others, doing more for God, doing more for ourselves. Um, and one, uh, this was, this concept was mentioned to me by, by multiple staff from Faye Alegria as the plus offered by Faye Alegria to their students. Uh, that's how they described it. Um, Umberto Porto Correo, he, um, he is a, a professor in a regular Jesuit high school, not part of the Faye Alegria network, but another program I visited. Um, he described it as an apostolic mission to go where others don't and said the spiritual cannot be divorced from the social. Uh, so I was taking that and looking at all the different values. Um, that come into play in Jesuit education in Bolivia. But to look at uh, how these values actually look like on the ground, I was also looking at what actually gets taught. Um, this is a llama. <laughs> um, this, is, this is at a school in El Alto. Um, it's called the Colegio Luis Espinal Colpani. It's a primary and secondary education, about 1,000 students in primary education, 1,000 in secondary education. And El Alto is, is a city right above La Paz. So La Paz is at about 12,000 feet. It's in a bowl in the mountains. And then El Alto is on the, the high plain surrounding it. Um, and El Alto is a, is a primarily indigenous city of people that um, they or, or their parents have migrated from more rural areas to work in La Paz and now also in El Alto. Uh, so this school um, is a uh, Hum, hum, humanities education and technical education. So in the morning, all the students attend classes in, in math, science, reading, religion. And then, then in the afternoon, they attend classes for a trade. They select a trade once they're in high school. Um, younger, younger children often work in agriculture and get, get to try out a few of the different areas. And then once they're in high school, they pick an area that could be carpentry. Um, so a lot of them stick with agriculture. They could be working on sewing, fashion design, um, and so their education has this dual perspective. Um, and I think that's a really important part of how Fe y Alegria's values look like in education. Um, this is integral education. It's looking at the whole person and everything that you need to be successful in Bolivia. Oops. Another really important aspect is who is taught. Um, and this is the value more of, of inclusive education. Fe Alegria has always been dedicated to serving the poor, uh, but they have some questions about what that really means now. Um, I, I talked to Miguel Angel Marque. He is the coordinator for all of regular regular education programs for Fe Alegria in Bolivia. Um, and he, he said to me, who are the poor? From the classical tradition, the poor are those who have no money and no access to certain goods and services. But I think they are not the poor. There are faces of women, indigenous people, those living in isolation and hunger, we have to make a more dynamic analysis of who are the poor and what choosing to serve the poor implies. So this, this is a class, um, a, a culinary class uh, for, for students, including students with disabilities. Um, I met a student in this class uh, who became blind uh, when she was a young adult. Uh, and so Faye Alegria in Santa Cruz, um, in a different part of the country, has really focused on this issue of special education, which is something that the government in Bolivia has not um, they really haven't done all that they can to serve those students. Uh, the students are often in, in separate centers. They don't have the same opportunities. So Faye Alegria uh, had some of their own special education centers, and they realized that wasn't, that wasn't going anywhere. So now what they do, they help students uh, in either programs that are specifically for students with disabilities or integrated programs, inclusive programs, uh, learn a trade. And then they set them up with an internship. And the internship is to really to help educate the, the companies more than to educate the students, um, to help educate the companies that these are people who can work, who can do very good work, and who are important members of society. And then after the internship, they work with the companies to, to hopefully hire the students. Um, so who is taught is really important, and that's something that Faye Alegria has always focused on. Um, and another program that I looked at uh, that does a good job of combining both of these important aspects, integral education, inclusive education, it's called the Yati Canuta in Trinidad Pampa. Trinidad Pampa is in the Yungas, which is an area um, at a slightly lower elevation from La Paz, but nearby, 
um, more of a tropical cloud forest region. Um, and this is a much more rural region. So many of these students don't have access to education beyond the sixth grade in their homes. So Faye Alegria started these schools. They're kind of like boarding schools. Um, but they do, they do a lot more than that. Uh, Yatikanuta means our house. And the students that live there, they attend the high school in town. Um, they all come from communities very nearby. Uh, but they also, they prepare all the food for the house. There, there's a student who's assigned as the accountant. There's a student that makes up the menus. Uh, students come up with the plans for what they're doing for their cultural nights and sport, sporting events. Um, they have, they have uh, values education. Um, and all, the students are all organized into two brigades to really make the house work. So they're learning, um, they're learning trades and productive skills. They're learning you know, everything you'd learn in a regular high school. And they're learning democracy, citizenship, civic participation. Uh, the, students, the students at this school, um, at, in this home, uh, talking about what they loved about it, they said, we share with everyone. Um, they said, we learn values. They said, we come here to learn and grow so we can have better lives. We share, we open up more, and they challenge us so we do well in the future. The parents are also very involved. Uh, that's a new step that Faye Alegria has taken, is rather than just providing this school, the parents have a lot of responsibility. Um, so Florencio Cocoyanca, he's had, he's had students here for quite a few years. Um, and he said, when my son came here, he began to think, to learn what he hadn't learned at home, to work, get up on time, collect his things, keep clean. It was a very dramatic change. Um, and so the parents, the parents really appreciate this, that their students come home and, and clean the house, but they're also, you know, learning to be productive members of their communities. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, some of the values that get taught, it's not just, you know, valuing each other as people and sharing with each other, but it's also valuing hard work, punctuality. They have a very strict schedule um, and, and valuing participation and teamwork and learning how to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So these Faye Alegria programs, all of these programs I've mentioned, the government has taken an interest in them. Um, this was from, uh, it says Testimonios de Vida at the top. Uh, it was a, an educational award ceremony held by, by the government, the Ministry of Education. Um, and Faye Alegria won quite a few awards. All these people are from different programs here. Um, and so it's great to see that they've been taking notice. Silvana Gonzalez, the woman who, who was helping me most with this project, said the hallmark of Faye Alegria is to think of innovative things that haven't been done but demand attention. And that's really what they're doing. They're doing that for technical education. They're doing that for students with disabilities, students in rural areas. And the government is taking notice. But, pardon the pun, <laughs> um, this, is, this is the highway between La Paz and El Alto um, with some of the mountains in the background. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. And the biggest, the biggest piece is around teacher training. When I asked... Um, Father Rafael Correa, what he would change about education, if he could change one thing, he said, I want a whole new generation of teachers. Um, so this is a big deal. Faye Alegria, um, one of their reasons for excellence is they focus a lot on teacher training, um, but they don't train all the teachers in the country. Uh, so there are still a lot of challenges around that, around, around salaries, around hiring, around education. But finally, to conclude, so I did find that um, that Jesuit human and Christian values are very important. These values for magis, for inclusive education, integral education, those are very, very important. Um, and they're not just important in that they teach values and talk about values, but they act through their values. And the staff were very conscious of this. Many staff said, you know, you can teach, you can teach punctuality and, and hard work, but then the teacher shows up late one day and, you know, it's all out the window. They're very, they're very conscious of, of being models and also of their students modeling these values for each other. Um, and finally, these programs are a model for the rest of, of Bolivia, and they've been, they've been much more involved purposefully recently um, in terms of joining networks, working with other organizations, advising the government, but there's still, there's still a long way to go. Um, they do have more than 430 schools uh, or different educational programs in Bolivia. That's huge, but it's still not, not a huge percentage of all the students that are in Bolivia. Um, they're working on it. Um, and I want to leave you with, um, with just one quote uh, from Mag Magda Aguirre, who oversees, um, basically she oversees the, the job training aspects of, of education. Um, and she was talking about social justice. And she said, what's fair is to give more to those with less and less to those with more. But after 500 years of my family or myself having a lot, why should I now have less? So what happens is people say, oh, I'm sorry, you're hungry. I'll give you a dollar. This is the problem. And I want to challenge us all as, as Georgetown students, as researchers, um, 
as as students in general to think about social justice in this context. And this was something I struggled with here, recognizing that my plane ticket down to Bolivia maybe could have done a lot more good giving a scholarship to some of those kids at the Yatikanuta and wrestling with, okay, since I'm here in Bolivia, how do I make the best of this chance and the best of this research so that it is really looking at social justice? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Masha Gontrova, um, and I did a project on uh, a Russian emigre com community in, in France. Uh, I'd also like to echo my former fellows by saying that I'm eternally grateful to the Berkeley Center and to the ACER program in Paris for giving me the opportunity to find out more about this Russian Atlantis, um, really an, a hidden gem of a culture preserved. And But before I go into that, a quick overview of what happened to the Russian emigres. The, they were, uh, they fled Russia under persecution by the Bolsheviks. And uh, their emigre community is very interesting in that they're not, they don't follow a typical pattern of exile. They built up the Russian emigres, these families. They were uh, traditionally the most, um, you know, the best families of Russia who, who literally intellectually, historically, professionally built up a, a, an empire which was uh, destructed completely by the Bolsheviks. Their families were killed. They were tortured in prisons. Uh, so their story is one of a lost hope. They ran from a country that they loved. Uh, so in, in a sense, yes, the material impoverishment hit them hard uh, in the early, from about 1900 to 1920, and they were desperately impoverished throughout Europe. But more importantly than that, they lost a hope and their story, what I saw when I came this summer, was rebuilding hope through faith, through specifically the Russian Orthodox faith. And that really touched me in a way that I didn't expect because I saw it. I, I was I uh, was awed that after five generations in exile, the community traditionally, you know, exiled communities assimilate into the culture, kind of rebuild themselves separately. And in a while, you can't even tell that who they were, you know, five generations ago. This community has stayed together. It has kept its cultural ties so close and so intimate, uh, and it's been through the Russian Orthodox faith. So that really awed me, and it, this this project really gave me a chance to explore that further. So my questions were, how did the emigres prevent the loss of culture, language, and religious heritage um, in, ex in their expatriate communities? And how did education become a meaningful, and I would argue the most meaningful, way to preserve and transmit their lost culture? Uh, so this is Alexander Nevsky Cathedral. It is in the 8th arrondissement, which is the center of Paris, a gorgeous place. It was built by uh, Alexander II before the emigres even became uh, exiled. Uh, so this is actually not typical of what emigre culture looks like. They're scattered around the 15th and 16th arrondissements in the corners of Paris, very outsides, and more of them are outside of Paris in small towns. Um, but this is where they came to literally live. Um, I have a really powerful quote um, from uh, someone who remembers their grandfather, who was a Russian um, army general who fought against the Bolsheviks to keep his land and came to Paris and was a window washer. And then his son, who was expecting to go, who was in a, a really nice Russian university, was also a window washer. Um, and he said, when the workday was over, they would put on their old uniforms and their nicest piece of clothing and go to this cathedral. They tried to forget their hardships and again become their old selves. So the, that cathedral and a number of other ones really became the places where Russian emigres fostered a culture um, and fostered an opportunity to kind of, they to develop what they had while retaining a sense of self. Um, they felt that God laid out um, the path to the West like an apostle-like mission. There were many writers, poets, who were all concerned with religion. This occupied their activity during periods of hardships. We could say that their impoverished situation in Paris resulted in the birth of great talent. Um, as you can see, they're playing a balalaika. They've kept balalaika groups, choirs, choruses, um, even chess teams uh, that play in the Russian tradition. Uh, there's the Rachmaninoff school uh, on the actually right on the Seine because it got a really nice fund. Uh, before that, it was two pianos in the outskirts of Paris in an apartment uh, that people came to play with all the time. So you could see that they they really did lose material, all hope. But what was more detrimental to them was kind of a, a spiritual lack of self that they were able to rebuild um, 
and I wouldn't say with the excuse of, but I would say with a returning of, to uh, their religious foundations of orthodoxy. Because um, kind of in the late 19th century, right before the Bolshevik Revolution, they weren't necessarily all that connected to the Orthodox religion. Of course, they went for Easter. Um, I spoke to, right now, the archdeacon, uh, Alexander Kedrov, and he was telling me that beforehand it wasn't it wasn't as if religion was the main part of their lives because right now it very much is. Um, but when they when they came to Paris, they saw that, and other they're also in Berlin. There's a big community in Berlin and throughout Europe. It was really religion that saved them and allowed them to have the hope to continue and prosper. That's not to say they're all they're all mostly middle class French families right now, but I I would like to say that one thing that religion let them do is maintain their sense of Russian identity and their sense of really great Russian identity throughout the turmoil and chaos of losing their homes. Um, so this might look like a church, but I will say it's not the inside of Alexander Nevsky Church or any other place that on the outside looks like a church. This is actually the inside of um, an apartment building with a kind of recreation room on the bottom of it. What happened when they moved is that they didn't really have money to build more places to worship. But worship became a very large part of their lives. So these icons, all of these icons, are ones that they built. They literally hid in their suitcases as they fled Russia. And these churches now carry mu much more meaning than they any other regular place because these are all relics from a past that they single-handedly have handed down and that only they own from a moment in history. So these kind of churches exist throughout Paris. There's an apartment um, with a living room. That's one of these churches. And then they have a kitchen and everything. They just use that for people to come come and worship. Um, and it's it's interesting because specific groups of families go to different churches. Uh, so they've really developed a really individualized Orthodox culture in a place that's not their own. Um, and that's was traditionally, of course, Catholic France. Um, and another, of course, interesting aspect of this was education, the thing I focused most on was education in the Alexander Nevsky School and through a number of uh, youth groups, which are, there are five youth groups in all in Paris, three of which I was able to focus on really deeply. Um, and all of them have summer camps, all of them have after school programs. Um, and one of the teachers in them uh, said this, even though they maybe don't understand all of the words or details of the language, they understand the meaning behind it. Without the family culture and growing up to understand Russia, these kids would not be who and how they are. And She's really accurate in that when I spoke to these kids and kids my age, we spoke in French. I spoke in Russian to people, uh, you know, Filatova's age or people older than that. The assimilation process is occurring materially, as in they're really, they're obviously French in their manner, the kids. It, when they speak Russian, it's, it's with a French accent, which is normal because it's been six generations and they have no physical ties to the land there. But what's enabled them to retain this and enabled them to retain an interest in Russia, um, specifically like pre-1917 Russia, is this understanding of the Russian culture. It's something deeper. It's something that is like music, touches a part of you that isn't accessible with material things like words. It's something that's faith. Um, it's something that is culture. Um, and that, that really carried out to me in these classes that I was observing. Um, and I, again, repeat, materially, this is a sale, a yarmarka, of their old Russian relics. They sell these gorgeous things that are worth so much. And when I was there at this sale of their, their items, they, they do this to actually generate money for a program called Aser Rusi, which uh, gives funds for people to travel to Russia and help in Orthodox food clinics there. Um, so this these are really nice icons. This is a really nice Russian plate. Um, and unfortunately, they, I mean, Actually, fortunately, they, it's not like they re these material parts of their past really matter. What matters is that they generate money to spread the faith and to uphold the traditions of their religion that matter more to them than, you know, specifically material. And this is just a picture of the choir I was talking about. Um, and these are counselors for a summer program who uh, meet every single week to talk about how, and th like these are young people like us, they meet every single week to talk about how they can transmit their faith to the younger generations. Um, they're counselors for a camp. So that's, that's that. Yeah, so thank you. 
now we're going to hear from Professor Catherine Marshall and Professor Whistler again with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to all of you for wider Q&A. Well, I think what we should do is mostly hear from you. Um, I'm Catherine Marshall. I'm at the Berkeley Center. So I'll tell you the questions that are in my mind as I go through this. First, I want to congratulate you. Those were very professional, well-timed, well-structured <laughs> presentations. They were something of a model. You can all learn from it. Um, I, one of the first questions I have is three weeks to do this kind of research is not much. So one of my questions is, if you'd had two more weeks, what would you have done? What are the questions that you'd have? Um, the second is that when you get this immersed in any program like this or any region, whether it's Uganda or Uruguay or, or Russia, um, one of the que it's very hard to leave it behind. Uh, and you, several of you mentioned the sort of network issue. So one of the questions is, uh, what could we do to build on what you did? Now, clearly, your research is partly to teach you about research. Uh, but we also do have in mind that it's going to feed into building a network and also building our knowledge about issues for education. And how can we do that more effectively? So those that's the the third is that that you're building on something that's a core part of what the Berkeley Center does. It's a, a sort of our sense that you can learn an awful lot by listening. And this very disciplined interview process where you don't just chit chat with someone and sort of do a journalistic story. You actually write down what they said and edit it and review it with the person um, so, that, so that it becomes something of a permanent record or you could even look at it as a permanent treasure. Um, what, what did you learn from that process? What, what came out of it? So, I, I, those would take, I think, maybe another two or three hours to answer. <laughs> so I just thought I would put those questions out and maybe see what other people have. I don't know. I, I would like to hear also questions from the audience as well. I think I would build on um, Professor Marshall's last question, and I think it was actually Charlotte who framed it as, is it useful for us? You know, how is it useful? What should we do with this information? And so I would build on that. But let's hear from, from people in the audience, whether it's about applying for the fellowship for the summer or to our specific fellowship, uh, to our specific fellows from this past summer. Any questions you have from them? Yes? Uh, hello. Uh, so I, I thank you for your presentations. They're all very interesting. I have a question on uh, the, the topics and the questions and the methodologies in particular. Uh, I noticed all of you did reports on schools uh, in particular and uh, the work going on at these schools and all your topics and research questions centered around seem to center around those, um, and all your methodology seemed to center around s interviews. And I was wondering how much freedom did you have in choosing that, and are there certain constraints to to the fellowship when it comes to what um, you have to do your research on? I might be able to answer a little bit of that. The fellowship is education and social justice, and so obviously the education part is, is important, but as you've kind of maybe the assumption underlying your question is that not uh, education is not just schooling. A lot of their stuff was about schooling, a lot of your research was about schooling, but it was also about informal education and then technical education as well, um, and community education, I would say. Um, so the Berkeley Center worked with the fellows to think about what kind of what skills they had, such as language skills, and to think about where, where those skills could be best be used. So whereas Shay had a very specific idea of Uganda that he brought to us, um, I believe that we worked with um, the rest of you to find kind of the right place, right, for, for where you could do the research based on contacts that the Berkeley Center had um, and, and obviously this great network of Jesuit-ness around the world, right? And so we, we build on those networks. But does anyone want to respond? Hi. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, as Professor Whistler mentioned, I had a particular idea of what I was looking to get out of out of um, time in Uganda, and that was because I was 
already thinking about a, a thesis project on refugees and forced migrants, which is related to and deepened by what I actually ended up studying, which was an internally displaced population um, in Gulu in northern Uganda. So I knew that I wanted to go to um, central southern Africa. Um, I looked around at possible Jesuit institutions there um, in countries where I also wanted to do my thesis. And one of the the geniuses of this fellowship is that it allows you to be quite creative. Um, I ended up working on this fellowship for three weeks, but I ended up staying in, in Uganda for five more weeks working on a development project, and then an additional two weeks in Tanzania and Zambia um, working on my thesis. So I, I was able to pack in a lot um, into a summer, but, but it was only made possible by this fellowship. This is weird. I've never talked into a microphone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, because you asked about um, kind of interviews, whether or not that was our main, um, that was our research. Our research was really interviews. We all did some, you know, reading into the country where we were going, obviously, because you need a little bit of context. But the foundation of the research is really talking to people. Um, and I think that's something that might be good to know going into this if you're thinking about whether or not you want to apply for this is, um, for me, it was an incredible learning experience. I had never done real interviews, like academic interviews for research. It is very challenging um, to sit for an hour, especially if it's like not your first language, um, to sit there, listen, write, write notes, record it, and then transcribe it and translate it. It's a long process. It can be frustrating, but it's also very interesting and very, I think all of our research, the what was so special about it is that we got all of our information firsthand from people working there. So none, none of what we told you is from books or from us sitting in, in libraries or going through archives in, in the country. It was really talking to the people working there. Um, so if, if that's the kind of research you'd like to try or you already know that you like, then this is definitely a, a good opportunity. Yeah, I, I would also like to add on the methodology question. Interviews are, are the core of this work. There's no doubt about it. Um, but there's a lot of other things that happen, too. Um, we all visited a lot of schools, had a lot of informal conversations. Uh, just as an example of the special education programs in Santa Cruz, I, had, I did one interview with the National Coordinator for Special Education and one interview um, with the person that's, that's the head of that team in Santa Cruz. All the rest, I spent three days just following them around. Uh, so we went to... Um, we went to a, a conference that Faye Alegria was tabling at and you know, just talked to the staff while they were interacting with parents there. Um, I went to a couple of the, the technical education centers that just happened to be nearby the offices. Um, and you know, I, just, I drove around with them to, different, to the businesses where the students are working. So there's, there's a lot that's happening while you're in country. Um, and a lot of this is up to you know, the people that you're working with. You may say, you know, I'm doing this project. We w we're supposed to do an interview. Do you have an hour? And they say, sure. And you come and they, you know, start driving you somewhere. And it's, you know, it may not be a formal interview. It may. Um, so definitely, you know, don't feel limited by the interview aspect. But that's really where we got um, really great information. Um, I guess I'll just add that um, one of the interesting things was that my host uh, partner institution was ASER, which is one of the youth groups, but there were, as I mentioned, five more, three of which I got in-depth interviews with by literally being in one place, getting invited to another. And then what I always, I had my camcorder always with me um, because I ended up transcribing from the video, uh, which was much easier. Uh, I suggest if any of you get this, bring a video <laughs> camera because then you can go back or a tape recorder. Um, but so, and those directly informed my understanding of my host institution, which I focused on, uh, and you can read about in the project. But the interviews around it, you can interview anyone you want that could inform your understanding of the host institution or the subject, which really gives you flexibility in where you go, what you do. I guess I was wondering, in addition to like language limitations, um, how did you come to choose your destination, I guess? Um, so language, again, for me was a big factor. I'm, I'm a Spanish major in addition to government, so Latin America made sense. Um, Faye Aguirre actually is active in Spain as well, but that's mainly just a fundraising arm. Um, and so once we started looking at Latin America, we were talking to Father Carnes uh, because he's very knowledgeable about education and social justice throughout Latin America. Um, and we decided that the Andean region would be a good fit for me since I had studied abroad in Ecuador. 
Um, and I, I wasn't so sure on whether I wanted to go back to Ecuador specifically, but I thought that if I was in a country like Bolivia or Peru, I would have a little bit more context um, with which to work. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be starting from zero. Um, and I thought that, you know, since three weeks is, is both a very long period of time, but a very short period of time, I wanted to be somewhere where I could hit the ground running. Um, and he, he suggested Bolivia. There's a lot of great work going on there. Fe Alegria is huge. Um, so that's how, that's how I wound up in Bolivia. And then Fe Alegria was, was a natural choice because it, um, it is a Jesuit program. There's no Jesuit university in, in Bolivia, so I was actually just hosted by the Jesuits. Um, they, they were my host institution, the, the Jesuit province. Um, but yeah, that, that was just a, a recommendation from Father Carnes, a couple emails, and then it, it all uh, happened from there. My story was like, uh, actually really interesting because I remember writing my application. It was like, what kind of research are you interested in? And I had just taken a Spanish sociolinguistics course and was like all about going to Latin America <laughs> in, my, in my answer. And then, but um, as the uh, process continued and we kind of got a sense of who the other fellows were, uh, it was, you know, I was made aware that there's already a lot of people going to Latin America. <laughs> so um, then Russia was being considered because I'm a Russian native, etc. Um, and I hopped on the Acer website and found this incredible community that I, I knew nothing about and few people do, which is why I'm so grateful for doing this project. Um, probably at like two months after I actually found, got news of my receiving the fellowship. So it's not like and like some, you know, person locks you into a fellowship and then you can't do anything. There, people are open and receptive to your ideas. And I was particularly passionate about this one, and I was given access to it. So it's like it's really flexible and welcoming to your ideas and what you want to do. Um, I already mentioned that I actually thought I would be going to. Um, southern Central Africa. Um, so actually, of, of the three projects, the, the Berkeley Center was the one that I came, at, uh, came about last. Um, and I have to confess, I'm not particularly interested in education policy. It deepened and enriched my understanding of a whole lot of refugee issues in different ways. Um, but for those of you who aren't necessarily interested in, in education, who are business majors, I, I want to encourage you to, to think about how you can apply this type of understanding to, to whatever it is that you do. Um, because it really is a, a golden opportunity. And, and being connected to the Society of Jesus, having a foothold in so many different countries, um, having an interest in travel, um, it, it really can all fall into place for you, even if you're not particularly interested in social justice or education specifically. I'll just add my uh, little story of how we got to Uruguay. Um, so basically, as I think Lisa mentioned, language was kind of a thing, and especially dealing with the countries that we have been in the past, it was always kind of like, I think we were in India before where English was fine, and we were in S South Africa and Kenya or somewhere where English was fine. And then Latin America is always kind of, if you really want to get information and if you don't want to just work in the university itself, then you really do need Spanish. So I remember talking to Andrea and Melody, who's also um, worked with us in initially, um, and they basically asked, you know, if, since you speak Spanish, would you like to go to Latin America? And I said, absolutely. Um, and then for me, it was kind of actually the, the, the other side of what Lisa experienced. So I had lived in Peru and really wanted to have a different experience in Latin America. And so Uruguay, which is a very different culture, very different climate also is freezing cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> freezing cold. <laughs> um, and so that was very different. And I said, I, I would like to go somewhere that's different but I do speak Spanish, so I'll, I'll you know, manage. Um, but I think in general, for all four of us, the thing to remember is that the Berkeley Center is incredibly flexible. If you have a good idea, if you have a place you want to go, then suggest it. But at the same time, I think it's more about the project and less about the place. So we looked for what universities can we work with, what schools are there, what projects do they have, versus we're really interested in this country, so we're going to find something there because that's just harder and less productive. So think more, if you're looking into what you want to do, think more about what areas interest you, so what, what aspect of education or social justice interests you, and where could you research that. Yes? 
Hi, um, this isn't necessarily an academic question, but I was just wondering how emotional the research process was, especially conducting interviews, and then how was it compiling the report? I'll go. Um, so like I, like I mentioned at the end of mine, I really struggled with this issue, particularly when I was at the, the Yatika Nuta, the, um, the, the boarding school basically for students, um, because I, had, I did a group interview there with, the, um, with a lot of the parents. I also did another group interview with the school board for the, the regular high school that those uh, students attend while they're there. Um, and both of those groups, in uh, the parents from the Atikonuto were talking a lot about, you know, they were very happy with the school, with how their students were learning, but they also talked about a lot of challenges. You know, they wanted to build this, that, and the other thing. They, they said multiple times they felt like orphans. They didn't get the support they needed from the government because of Faye Alegria, but Faye Alegria depends on the government. Um, so there was there was a, a big push of asking for resources, um, and then when I when I was at the the regular high school again they were saying we need scholarships we need something for our kids they they get this good education and then they go nowhere we we need help um, so that was that was very emotional for me recognizing how much privilege I have coming in there um, how much privilege I have how much money I have how much money Georgetown has to be able to send us to do this um, and you know the amounts you're talking about in Bolivia is very small. On the other hand, um, I did learn a lot from doing those interviews and from spending time. I actually I lived at the Yadikanuta for um, just for a couple of days to get a, a bigger picture of what was going on. Um, that I think you know, if I hadn't had that experience, any resources that would get put to scholarships may not have been as well used. For example, they said some of the students that do wind up going to school in La Paz, which is very close. La Paz is only about you know three four hours um, from the Yungas where where this school was. Um, but the students who go there, very, very few of them make it. Um, they said there's a huge issue of discrimination uh, of people from the city versus people from rural areas. There's a huge amount of discrimination of, against people that grew up speaking an indigenous language. All the children at the Yatikanuta are from Aymara speaking families. Uh, the children, the children understand it. They grew up speaking Spanish, um, but they still, you know, they have an accent. They speak differently than people that grew up in the cities. Um, and you know, there's also uh, there's also discrimination just based on the fact that they had this type of learning experience rather than going to you know one of the private schools in La Paz. Um, and so you know, one thing that came out of that was the parents were saying we should do something like the Yatikanunta, where the students can support each other and work together and be in a in a healthy, safe environment for college. Um, and that's a fantastic idea. And I think you know, learning things like that makes it worthwhile because otherwise if someone decides to throw a bunch of money at this, they're still going to have all the same problems. The kids aren't going to make it more than a year because of all these other challenges. Uh, but it, it, it was hard. It's definitely hard. Um, I would say it's also emotional on the level of uh, sympathizing with the people you're interviewing and doing kind of not group interviews but group research. For instance, that picture of the camp counselor meeting obviously it went into the night and people started, you know, singing around a campfire and only like two or three people knew the Russian lyrics, but they didn't, they didn't speak Russian, they just sang in Russian because, you know, ancestral stuff. And then I paused them and I said, well, why do you sing lyrics and you don't speak in Russian? Is that fair to you? And I apparently touched on a hot topic because um, <laughs> there are people fiercely divided over whether they should retain their Russian or not and people who are upset at their parents and grandparents for not learning the language. And I was on the camp that you should definitely maintain the language, but there were some people who said it's, it's worthless and worth, like completely worthless. And they got into a, like a, literally a screaming fight. A guy got up and left because <laughs> Russians are really passionate and everything and so are the French. So. Um, but that, like it was, and I was like really upset at this, and it was a really heated thing that I had touched off. And these were all my interview subjects. I would be like, I had like five interviews that day, and then the, and the next morning I had like five more. And it was like it, they were my friends; they were my age. Um, when I was interviewing, uh, actually, the director of a school, she said that now more and more people from the Ukraine, from Belarus, from former satellite states are coming in and asking for full tuition funds, whereas the traditionally the Russian emigres got 50 and matched 50 percent of the school funds, and mostly that just pays for like the electricity and stuff. And she says we can't give these kids full scholarships, even though the people from Belarus and stuff who are coming in right now need them a lot more than the Russian emigre families who are already established. And I completely disagreed with her, and, and like it's hard because I couldn't say anything, and I really wanted to. I wanted to be like, well, 
Like, can't you find some way? But you can't, you can't, um, that's how they do it. And it's not your place to say, hey, I'm a Georgetown student. I've been learning about like public policy and this is what I think you should do. You have to kind of like, this is a research thing, not a you go and fix their problems kind of thing. And that was something I struggled with a lot. Just one quick comment. Um, be prepared to be surprised. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I knew that I was going into a, a war-torn area, like I said, post-conflict. LRA had affected it as, as, early, um, as late as five years ago. Um, but so you do have those moments, but you also have the moments where, you know, Father Walk is playing a practical joke on you on your first day. Um, you don't even really know each other. Um, <laughs> and, and trust me, you don't know humiliation until you're the only white person out there on a, a soccer field and you miss the ball. <laughs> Um, with a crowd of, you know, little kids about this high. Um, just, I think, entering into it um, with, with openness um, and generosity. Um, you'll have your highs and you'll have your lows, but knowing that you have the support of the host institution and the support of the Berkeley Center back here, um, it means something.